Hey guys, and welcome back to Mad About Skin. In today's video, we're talking about a question which you guys have been asking in droves over the past couple of weeks, and that is, are all lotion or lightweight sunscreens a lie? Are they actually all gonna be delivering lower than the SPF 50 that we've all come to know and love from these style of products? And is it possible to formulate a SPF 50 in a lightweight, gorgeous, silky, non-white cast formulation? I imagine most people have started to question this on the back of the Purito sunscreen scandal, which I've covered extensively on this channel already so I'll leave a link to a video I did on it up there and some updates rather than go into any detail now but on the back of that the Korean Institute of Dermatological Sciences over in well Korea decided that they would test all of the widest and the largest selling Korean sunscreens that are on the market test them for their efficacy and what SPF they actually deliver now we haven't had any firm and hard results from that testing yet but the update that was given over the Christmas period did say that whilst they've testing is still underway, the majority have not lived up to the SPF 50 or 50 plus, which have been advertised on the products. Maybe the most telling thing to come out of that video was the conclusion that the Institute of Dermatological Sciences drew, where they said that actually formulating a sunscreen with an SPF protection value of a 50 or 50 plus, whilst maintaining that really lightweight, silky and gorgeous feeling to the product, is almost impossible. And it requires some really high level formulating skill to be able to deliver. So that led me to believe, are we actually fooling ourselves? And are most of those lightweight sunscreens that we know and love failing to live up to our expectations in terms of SPF? So let's break it down and talk about it in this video today. Now, first and foremost, I think it is at the company's responsibility to be able to guarantee the product that was in the bottle lives up to the marketing claims and the statements on the bottle. As consumers, we should have full confidence that what we're buying is what we're getting in terms of product. What's advertised is what's in the bottle. And I don't think there should be any excuses for that. I do know that some companies that have fallen foul of this have come out and said, well, the manufacturing was the problem. That's true, but you can't outsource your responsibilities to the consumer. If you are taking the profit, taking the money from the consumer, you need to be delivering what is in that bottle. If you outsource your manufacturing, that's fine, but with it goes responsibility and you have to make sure that you're manufacturing a product which lives up to what you're advertising it as. However, I do think we need to moderate our own expectations on sunscreens just a little bit, because when we say, uh, when we answer the question, are all lotion or lightweight sunscreens a con? Can they actually live up to that SPF of 50? When you think about it, we're not actually just asking for these products to live up to an SPF of 50. We as consumers place a baffling array of demands on brands. We want them to be lightweight. We want them to be non-greasy. We want non-ashy. We don't want a white cast. We want a mineral sunscreen sometimes. We might want a chemical sunscreen the other time. We want the highest SPF value, but we want low, low prices because we want everything to be drugstore and affordable. We want cruelty free. We want free fragrance free, we want colorant free. It is totally baffling what we demand as consumers. And there's very little compromise. We kind of want it all. I am just as guilty as anyone. I've kind of wanting my products to deliver everything I expect and then get really frustrated when there's a company out there, that, there's no company out there that actually delivers that. Because we're placing so many of these demands, focus has gone away from the protection factor, which let's be honest, is the core thing, the core purpose for a sunscreen. If focus has gone away from that and onto all these other things that we're demanding, which is why I think somehow it's got lost in and amongst all the other demands. Now, we're all sat here patiently awaiting the testing results from the Korean Institute of Dermatological Science, where they're gonna release a whole suite of testing in the next couple of months on Korean sunscreens. We're all waiting to see if our favorite one, for me, the Make Prem UV Defense Fluid is the one I literally cannot wait to hear about, because I'm hoping, hoping, hoping it comes out as a really good SPF, and I can continue to use the product. The Purito sunscreen scandal left us all a little bit shook, and I know that we're waiting for that data. However, I imagine when that data is released, most of these sunscreens that we know and love will come back at an SPF of around 30. That leads us then to the ultimate question of this video is, are we expecting too much thinking we can get a lotion sunscreen, a lightweight, non-ashy, non-greasy, lovely to apply sunscreen in an SPF protection of 50 or 50 plus? And I think in its basis, 
Probably we are. So let's take it right back and work out what we actually need from our sunscreens. So first of all, I would say to people, do you actually need an SPF of 50 or 50 plus? In our brains, we're all trained to want the strongest product, the strongest active ingredient, the highest concentration, and that is no different when it comes to sun protection factor. We all go for the SPF of 50 or 50 plus. In some countries, here in the UK, and I believe over in Australia, you can't actually advertise products as above an SPF of 50 or 50 plus. In some countries they can go up to you know 100 SPF 150 200 and that's all designed to get people to buy into that product because we want the strongest of everything as consumers actually do we need an SPF of 50 there are some people out there that most certainly do if you have some um, autoimmune diseases you could have some skin issues you could be living with really fair skin in a real high UV um, radiation country such as Australia where you do need that extra level of protection however for me someone who is you know, mid skin tone. I'm not the lightest. I'm certainly not the darkest in terms of my skin tone. So I've got a base level of protection here in the UK where the UV ray index is quite low, particularly in winter. Do I actually need an SPF of 50? Absolutely not. My skin will be perfectly protected with an SPF of 30. And just as a comparison, I'm going to leave an article below that actually spend, spells out the differences between an SPF of 30 and 50, which aren't that great at all. So check that article out if you're a little bit concerned about maybe reevaluating whether you need an SPF 50 or not. I'm hoping when this testing is done, companies will do tweaks to their formulation, reformulate, it, but most importantly, change their packaging, apologize, and put the right SPF on these products so that we can then, as consumers, buy them. No what we're getting as a product and the level of protection that we're getting. We just might need to moderate our expectations a little bit. We also may need to reevaluate our thoughts on alcohols, in particular drying alcohols. So people seem to think that alcohol is this like the tool of the devil. You hear people say alcohol products like, oh, I don't want to go anywhere near my skin, it's the worst thing ever. It's a total overreaction. I think we've seen sub influencers, beauty blogs and stuff, really demonizing alcohol in products. We're not talking about alcohol laden products that we used to have in the 90s, where that toner would strip the skin, leave you dry, your pores were shrunk, but your skin was red raw and almost falling off your face. We're not talking about that level of alcohol. We're talking about small levels of denatured alcohol or other types of alcohols added into products to make for a more pleasant application on the skin. Similarly, if the product is formulated with hydrators alongside that drying alcohol, again, it's not going to strip and dry your skin. There are some people who have a real sensitivity to denatured alcohol. If that's you, you shouldn't, you know that, and you obviously wouldn't take this advice and leave it in your skincare routine. But for most of us, we can get away with using a little bit of denatured alcohol in our products every single day. The reason I mention this is it will thin out a product and make it much more lightweight and less likely to be greasy on the skin. So if you take something like the Biore UV Fluid, a product which is a Japanese sunscreen tried and tested and delivering an SPF of 50 in a really lightweight, almost matte formulation. So people say, why can they deliver it when we suspect a lot of the Korean sunscreens we love aren't able to deliver it? And that's because of the inclusion of drying alcohol in this product. This means it evaporates from the skin, taking with it some of that greasiness and the heavy nature of the product, which then leaves you with the sun protection of SPF of 50, but in a really lightweight and matte finish. So I do think as as consumers we need to reevaluate our relationship with denatured and drying alcohols because I do think there is a place for them in some skincare formulations. To conclude, what I would recommend is I think we need to start prioritizing the protection level that we need first and foremost. So work out what level of protection you want from your sunscreen. That's like the first step in working out which one's right for you. Beyond that, I would then say the protection level should be the number one thing we look for. If it's not delivering that, there is no point in the product. And then beyond that, list what's actually important to you as a consumer in the order of importance. So is it that the product is cruelty free? Does that is that the number one thing when you're purchasing a sunscreen? Or is it that it's fragrance free? Maybe it's that it's from brand, a local brand in your country, so you're shopping locally. Maybe it's something comes down to being um, colorant free or alcohol free. Work out what's really important to you. And then you can almost map in order those priorities to the products that you're buying. At some point, you're gonna to have to accept that a product isn't gonna meet all your expectations because I think as consumers, we have too many and place too many on consumers. That should help you find your favorite sunscreen. I actually did a video on the tried and tested sunscreens that have independently 
definitely being verified. And I'll leave a link to them up there. You can check that out and work out if any of those might live up to your expectations or what you're looking for in a product. As we await for these results from the Korean Institute of Dermatological Sciences, hopefully we can find and reevaluate our relationship with sunscreens and find the right ones for us. I don't think lightweight sunscreens are a lie. I think they're absolutely fine. I don't want to see us go back to those days of the thick, gloopy, white cast, horrible sunscreens of the 80s and 90s. But I do think to expect the lightweight formulation with an SPF of 50 or 50 plus may be just a little bit of a step too far. We might need to reevaluate our own needs in terms of the level of protection we want to get from the product and how that relates then to the texture of the product that we're going to end up using. You want a higher SPF? It may be the offset to that is that you have a thicker and less elegant application and texture to the product. If you're happy with a lower SPF, then you can benefit from that lightweight, glossy, lotion-like product formulation. I hope this has helped guys. Um, let me know which sunscreens you're using at the moment. I actually am reusing the Purito Unscented Centella Green Level Sun. I know this is the one that's kickstarted all this controversy. It's been tested and independently verified as an SPF of 28, which whilst it's not what's on the bottle, and I don't think that's acceptable, I am still using it because A, it's cruelty free, it works with my skin type, and an SPF of 28 or 30 is absolutely fine for my skin type in the UK in winter, where I'm not exposing my skin to too much UV radiation. So I'm continuing to use that and I would like to see them reformulate slightly and then obviously update the packaging with the new SPF once that's confirmed and tested by Purito themselves. Wherever you are in the world guys, stay safe, stay well and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Take care. Bye.